Good evening, everybody. It's great to have you all back. My name is Jacob Sustaipa. I'm the assistant conductor for Pacific Symphony. I have a very special guest with me this evening for our mixer, our guest conductor this week, Anna Billmeyer. Anna, Anya, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's really exciting to be able to do this type of talk and session. So it's been a little while since we've had a mixer. Welcome back to everybody who's joining us. It's great to be able to do this again. This it provides us an opportunity to kind of get a behind the scenes look at what's gone on this week and to mostly to talk to our guest artists, to say hi, to ask them about the repertoire and just to get a closer look at what, what goes on during the week, getting ready for a concert. So Anya, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Thank you very much for the invitation. I, I'm very um, fine and looking forward. And I'm very excited. Uh, first time in California for me, first time with Pacific Symphony. And yeah, it's, it's such a big pleasure and honor for me. And I love to work with you and your orchestra and we're all together. It's fun. It, it has been an exciting week. Um, I can't think of a better program really to come back from our break during the new year. Uh, the pieces on this concert are like the bread and butter of orchestral repertoire. We've got a Tchaikovsky concerto and a Brahms symphony. It, it seems like it couldn't get better than that. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts about the repertoire? Yeah, I mean, you're completely right. It's both uh, masterpieces very, very beautiful, very deep music, passionate, full of color, full of life and full of, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So I think it's, it's perfect. And, um, and we enjoyed a lot to work in it and we're very excited to perform it for you and uh, for, yeah, and yeah. To look forward to the concert. I know, I hope, I hope everybody who's on this mixer, if, if you're not able to be at one of the concert performances Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, we will be streaming the concert live on YouTube on Friday night. So I hope you can catch it. You don't wanna miss this concert for sure. It has been so exciting to see you work with the orchestra, Anya. And before we get started on all that, I, I just wanna tell everybody a little bit about who you are and where you're coming from. I know your bio, biography is available on our website, but you're the chief conductor of the Residency Orchestra in Amsterdam and The Hague. And as you mentioned, this season, you're making your debut with Pacific Symphony, but also the BBC Symphony, BBC Philharmonic, Finnish Radio Symphony, Swedish Radio Symphony, Danish National Symphony, and many others. And you're returning to Gothenburg, Barcelona. Wow. What's it like traveling the globe right now as a conductor? I mean, I love it. It's great every week somewhere else, meeting new people, getting to know new languages, new lifestyles, meeting the orchestras and our audiences and seeing new concert halls. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, I'm so glad. And I think I have the best job in the world, I have to say, because I'm, yeah, I'm allowed to learn and to grow every week. And I, I really enjoy that a lot. But yes, for sure, at the moment with the COVID situation, it's still a bit tricky with all this testing and um, traveling. And But um, I have to say, f until now, I was lucky. I, I stayed healthy all the time and, and I had a chance to conduct all the time. So just in the first part of the pandemic, many opera things were canceled because that's still tricky. But luckily, we found ways to go through with, with the orchestra with bigger distances or a streaming concert. But now it's so great that we have our audience back because that's made, it, it only makes then sense when the audience is, is there, when like the energy is in the hall and we can share the feelings. And yeah, we need that. We, we cannot do it without. So I'm very much looking forward to this live event. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said what you just said. Um, you know, we provide an artistic service and expression music for for our communities as orchestras and arts organizations, but we get just as much back by the presence of our audiences as I hope we provide them. And I'm so glad you said that. And I imagine, you know, you travel the world and you're with so many different orchestras in Europe and America and all over, but I think one thing stays the same and it's what you said, it's that energy that the audience also provides the orchestra. Um, in this time that we've been having some performances, even if a few members are, a few audience members are there, it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely, because we can feel it. And like this uh, concentration, 
and and the excitement and it's it's yeah and it's a communication thing art is about communication i think not just music but every art so it makes our yeah that makes is the makes the human being specific and that's we want to articulate us and want to communicate and if there's nobody where we can communicate and it's just then we have to imagine yeah there is somebody sitting on the on the on the other side of the line like now i would love to see all our guests now for example but at least i can see you which is very fine and nice but it's it's still i like the live part and that you can really feel and and and, and you breathe together and you share this unique moment it's just yeah it's one one second one moment one specific thing, and then it's gone I love that. Yeah, um, and I see a few people have continued to join us. Uh, welcome for those of you who joined us a little after five o'clock. Join, you're joining me and our guest conductor, Anna Billmeyer, as we talk about this week's concert with Pacific Symphony. And if anybody has a question throughout our conversation, please feel free to put it in the chat or the question and answer box. And as we go, I'll be watching those and our producer will be helping me to make sure that we get as many of those answered. So feel free to ask away. Oh, well, I, I see Rosalind. Uh, hello, Rosalind is looking forward to the concert tomorrow. So am I, Rosalind. I can't tell you how excited I am. Let's talk about this repertoire, Anna. This is amazing. Brahms Symphony Number no. 2, Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, both in D major. It's, this is music that is so happy and full of life, although very different composers, very different works. But the one thing that sticks out to me with these two pieces is it is optimistic. It is about the, the life shared and what gives, what gives and takes in music, lyric versus you know, storm and drag. What would you say about these two pieces, just what they provide the audience? Yeah, it's exactly what you have, what you just said. I mean, it's it's incredibly positive music and incredibly passionate music. And and the the, in, the fun thing is also that they're both composed like eighteen, like just one year um, apart from each other, so they are nearly the same age. Yeah. And the interesting thing is also that Brahms. I mean, it took him over twenty years to write the first symphony. Yeah, it was a problem after all those Beethoven symphonies to, to find a new style. So it was extremely tricky and he was really in a crisis. But then with the second symphony, I think he traveled to Perchach and Wörthersee, which is very a very beautiful scenery. And then suddenly he got so inspired by this beauty. And I have to say, for some reason, when I came here, I'm here for the first time in, in California and in Southern California. And it's so it's like a paradise for me, this blue sky. This, uh, the sun, then I was down at the sea and then a little bit along the harbor and, and in the nature and all those flowers and the palm trees. For me, it's like, I mean, it's, 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 it's so, it's really like paradise. And, and I thought it's, it fits so perfect. If Brahms would have been here, I think he, ha he ha would have been written the same symphony because it's so, it fits so well. And um, all those melodies and, and, yeah, and then also this passionate um, way of describing life, but always positive. Sure, sometimes we have a little bit, that's what I told the orchestra yesterday, maybe sometimes also a cloud shows up and then the sunlight goes away or we have a little bit of a wind and like a little bit of drama, maybe big waves. That's also in, in, in the slow movement, in the second movement, I find it a bit, so it's also drama, but then in the end, it's all positive and that's very different from the other Brahms symphonies, I think. Yeah, um, and Rosalind, the, asks, oh, Rosalind asks, of the four Brahms symphonies, do you have a favorite? I know that's a very difficult question to ask a conductor, but does, does one of them speak more to you than the other? No, I cannot say that because for me, Brahms is like a holy guy in a way, because I have also lived in his house in Lichten, Lichtenthal, so and lived there for wow. a while, and I feel very close to Brahms. And for me, every symphony is like, or every composition he wrote, there's no note additional or too much or too less. It's such perfect way of composing for me, and it's so deep, and I... I don't know it's for me everything is is so fascinating so I cannot say I love this more or that it's your you just go into the world of the symphony this it doesn't matter if you do one or two three four so yeah hard to say but I'm extremely 
thankful that we have those masterpieces and that we can pr perform it now for you. And yeah, it's, it's incredible. And also with the Tchaikovsky, I think it fits so well because it's, it's also, it's full of joy, full of, um, yeah, attention, full of beautiness. And um, yeah, and, and, and with Bomzori, it's, it's such a pleasure. Yeah, it, it wow, oh, watching yeah. you two last night was incredible. The communication between the two of you. Have you worked with Bomsori before? No, actually, we just met yesterday for the first time, and it's always exciting. So, like, yeah, it's 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 the same with, with the orchestra, with the new orchestra, like a date, you know. You you don't <laughs> it's like a beginning of a love story normally, and then you're excited, you go to the first date. Oh, how are they doing? What is it? And then you you test a bit, and then you talk while you're making music. That it's it's a communication for me. It's really a communication. Also, when the orchestra speaks in in their notes to us, and then like we all together. So, and that was big fun when this communication works, when everybody's open, and also not just speaking but also listening to each other, and then coming together and and going for something. That's really cool. And I think we. We found that yesterday together from the first minute on, I think, yeah. Oh, oh, I agree. It was amazing to see. And I imagine, you know, with how many artists you work with and different orchestras, um, sometimes it clicks like it did yesterday. And maybe sometimes it takes a little bit of time. It's really nice when it does click because uh, the music making, it just, it happened immediately. Yeah, and sometimes it doesn't click. That's also the truth. It's not, I mean, not every love story is a successful one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, our concert master, Dennis, uh, just sent him a note. Hey, Dennis, it's great to have you on. He said he just met you too, Anya. And like the program, you are so positive and upbeat. And Dennis, I echo that. Uh, what you brought, Anya, to the, to the concert hall, to the stage, to the musicians and the music, it, um, it's just, for me, it's exactly what we needed right now. Uh, the repertoire, you, your way of approaching it, your attitude towards making music, and of course, towards the players. Uh, it really has been a joy, and this concert is reflective of that in every way. The symphony, let's return to this. Yeah. So I love this symphony, too. I, I told you uh, early on in this week, yeah, it, I couldn't say I have a favorite symphony of Brahms either, but this one was the first to enter my life. As a player, when I was in my teens, as a violist, this was the first Brahms symphony I played and I was taken over by it. I couldn't believe music could do that as a player and the sound of it. Of course, I loved the, the quality of the joy overall, although there's ups and downs throughout the symphony, but it's just, it, it got in me at an early age and has always been a part of me. The first movement is, I always found a little perplexing. Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it, in the middle, and I'm generalizing, but it starts with a lovely tune, cellos and then horns and winds, and it's, it's just serene and sweet, but not long, it seems to scatter and just fall apart. The violins and violas play these octaves that are odd and that even falls apart. And then we're left with these trombones that play a very small like, chorale. And then the timpani rumbles like a storm is coming. But even that only lasts for one moment before the sunlight comes out and then the violins start to soar and it starts to grow. But just in that opening, um, what, what is this opening for you? Because um, I love it. It's just for me, I've always wondered what exactly is Brahms trying to paint for us? For me, it's a bit like to, to enjoy life or what life also means for me. It's, a, it's like a big present and I'm very thankful for it. And I enjoy, yes, that, I, that I'm allowed to live that life and to make the music and to, to feel that. And, and it's, it's a lot about it. Maybe it sounds a little bit sweet or I don't know. It's also with my language problems. I'm sorry, but it's the, it's the love to the life in the beginning of and that you really enjoy and, and your heart goes open and it's uh, and it's about the happiness and in, in life not about the dark sides and the problems it's just really if you're very very happy and everything is in in, in in is in peace and if you're in peace with yourself that's how it sounds for me this beginning it's very it's floating and you're 
it's very positive, but not, not happy. It's just very deep and honest. It's just the truth that you're from a very deep feeling. You say yes to everything and you, yeah. yeah. So. And then with the, what you said about those trombones, that's just a little bit like you think while you have this strong feeling and this um, being thankful and loving, you still have in your mind some memories. Ah, oh, yeah, maybe there are some other times in your life or in 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 your in the past which made it maybe tricky or difficult, or maybe you were afraid of something. That's like the trombone for me. It reminds you a bit about other things, but most of the time you stay in that mood, and that's um, so great about this symphony that it's yeah. always. It's not like a big drama with killing people and like in every opera and it's like you love and die and da, da, da. it's not like that it stays it's very deep and it stays positive most yeah of the time. and and i i found some interesting things that brahms said um so he was a, a real fun kind of guy and, and his friends often thought of him as a jokester in a way so brahms actually wrote to his publisher about the second symphony and he said he was joking. He said, it will at all events be a proper flop. And people will say this time I took it easy. The new symphony is so melancholy that you won't stand it. I have never written anything so sad. The score <laughs> must appear with mm -hmm. a black border. I have given enough warning. And you really still, are, are you really still proposing to buy yourself such a thing? We can always alter the terms. And that's what he wrote to his publisher, but he was joking. And yeah. a, a good friend of his, uh, also to the publisher, wrote back and, and said, it, it is a magnificent work. Every moment is gold. And all four movements together constitute a necessary whole. Vitality and strength are bubbling up everywhere. Deep feeling and charm to go with it. Such music can only be composed in the country in the midst of nature. Just like you were saying earlier, it seems so appropriate for this uh, climate and where we're at in beautiful yes. Southern California. Really, yes, absolutely. I find it, yeah, I, I was so, yeah, every day when I when I go out here uh, and, and, and in the morning it starts with this blue, blue sky and this, it's so incredible. And I'm coming now from winter times uh, from, from uh, Netherlands and it was rainy and dark and wet and, Oh, I don't know. So I, I, I was completely, I cannot believe it still. Well, we'll have to have you back more then, especially during the winter months. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> this, um, this cloud that we're, we were just talking about, it, it seems to show itself throughout the symphony in these little, little moments. Even the, the second theme of the first movement, the famous lullaby theme. Mm. So Brahms's lullaby, which he had written, um, it's almost an exact quotation of this slightly altered, and this time not with all the cheer of the lullaby that we all know uh, for young, young people, but it sounds very much like it. There's just a few more expressive turns here and there, but it, um, not to get too much into the analysis of things, it comes to the, to the movement in the wrong key the first time, and then it's reconciled shortly thereafter in the right key. Not that that matters so much, but there's something about it, about the expression of when a composer doesn't follow the rules of classical writing. So he, the first theme is in D major, the symphony is in D, and then the first time the second theme appears, it's in F sharp minor, and then it comes in A major, which is the key it should be in. There's just something expressive about that. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on this second theme, this lullaby. It's sung in the cellos and the violas. It is, as a violist, I love this moment. What for you as you conduct this and as you kind of navigate the architecture, is there, what are you thinking about as you go into this lullaby theme? It's a little bit tricky for me to, to say that because I'm not an analytic person that much. I know those things, but when I start to conduct, then it starts like the communication with the orchestra. And then we have like, we reach a specific energy or, a, and then 
yeah and then it i cannot say how it will be in the concert it's it's always different i i just feel how the energy and how the transition has to be and what it means in that specific moment for me but i'm not like i'm not planning to do it like this or that i try to be really in the moment yeah. and to to feel it new and to create it new together with the musicians so and that's maybe why I'm also a little bit a risk conductor or I, I like that or I try to work with with the orchestras quite hard in the rehearsal so that everybody knows how the structure works and where the lines are going to and how the whole thing is it's a little bit and how our strategy is it's like like a football team we say okay we play for um, so much so many strikers midfielders and and and, and it's like um like an idea how we want to play it that means how short are the notes? How long are the notes? Where's the line going? Where's the high point? Which um, um, instrument is leading? What is more important? And then we have like a network. Not sure if that's the right word, but like a net between the... So, and that's what I work on very hard so that then in the concert, we can be spontaneous and we have this freedom to create it for our audience and also I, we feel what is coming from the audience and then that's why this lullaby it's we will see how it will sound or in which direction it goes if it will yeah. be a little bit darker or it, if or, or if it will be a more happy one or more energetic one or if it's really like peaceful floating so there are many many possibilities and i i never know how it's we will we will see and find out when we do yeah. it I, i've noticed that when Every moment that you've worked with the orchestra, it's it sounds fresh, like it's newly coming forward, which is so nice. I think it can be easy to have a formula in, in what we do and stick to that. Not that that's a bad thing, but when you have the trust and are bold enough and courageous enough to be in the moment, this piece really comes alive, I think, when you let it do that. But it takes um, a certain amount of that's yes, you have to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right. And you have to study it. Also, you have to know the structure and everything first. But then it's um, as a conductor, you have to know what are your strengths or how you want to approach the music or what is it. And I'm a very intuitive person. And that's and the intuition. I think it's a knowledge, too. It's not just that it's somehow. Um, yeah, it's really a knowledge. And if I trust my knowledge about that, I know in that moment or that I know where the music is going, uh, then it's always right for me. Then when I listen back to it, that's what I'm doing to, to check if I really am. I'm not getting crazy or whatever. So that's I think it's extremely important just to follow that then. And if you conduct a lot of opera, that's what you learn there. I mean, you know, you have done a lot of opera too. You learn to build those dramaturgic things and you just, from the harmonies, you feel it and you know where you are and where you want to go and how to, to tell it's a story. We have to tell this story and, and, and about the tensions. And, um, and I'm thankful for that experience in the opera. And I bring that to the symphonic pieces and that helps me a lot. And then I just follow and flow also on what the orchestra is doing. And, and it's, yeah it's it's very different with every orchestra it's, it's it's different and it's very fascinating because of this communication you talk yeah. and get an answer and and I'm, you saw it yesterday you did such a great conducting oh. i was so extremely thankful that you conducted the last movement for for me that i could listen in the hall and check the balances and know how it sounds outside and and you were yours also so lively and so spontaneous musicians and it was oh, yeah. fantastic you. to to watch and to listen to you it was a joy um i am so thankful for that opportunity uh, and and also for you to be able to hear our amazing concert hall which um sounds so fantastic yes. and different in depending on where you're at every seat is really special um did did you enjoy being able to kind of get out there and experience what happens with the sound yeah, it was extremely exciting because still where you stand, like on the podium, it's different, the, the sound experience than when you're in the hall. So that was great. And then also your music director, Cousin Claire, was also there. That was so nice to get to know him too. And we're, we were sitting together and then I talked to him, oh, I hear that. And what do you think? And it was so, such a nice, yeah, 
uh, what is Zufall like? We, it wasn't planned. It was he was yeah. just coming for to visit and also to listen. And and then I met him for the first time. And then we heard heard the sound. And then we developed. It, it, I love that if it's like a team, you know, and with you too. And then yeah. you conduct and you listen. And and that's really cool that we all go for it. And yeah. And yeah, it, it all uh, just kind of fell together last night, and it was really, really amazing. Uh, Carl was there, you were there, I was there. I got to conduct, and um, the it was it was nice to have that sense of community and family, and that's really what I think Pacific Symphony is about, and what 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 my experience has been like as a part of the orchestra. So I'm I'm glad it all happened like that. Um, I, but I want to go back to you said something really fantastic about opera and the the drum the arc of the drama and for me the second movement of this symphony is is one big aria full of high moments low moments dark moments bright moments um it again starts with the cello almost almost recitative meets aria it's a little spoken it's a little sung what, what are your thoughts on the second movement yes this is for me i mean very exciting because it's so uh, not thick but so tensed everything the lines it's the the whole sound it gets really fo focused so you have a, a lot of energy and it gets very very hot like if you put things together or not, and then you create lots of energy first movement everything is like flowing and it gets free and it feels free and the energy is much more like this and, and the way but the second it's more and more compact so and 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 that's very exciting to experience that and the melodies and what's going in the bassoon for example always trying to get out of this getting stuck into this energy and getting out and then and also as a as a conductor to decide do you want to keep it like that and to to and to keep this fire and this burning thing or do you want to open it up at one and, and to let it free and to let it bloom or you, do you really want to get to hold it like, so that's always my a little bit my question while i'm conducting that wow i i i, I hear everything you're saying and I, I i got that sense from hearing you work with the orchestra it's a, it's a beautiful movement it's full of intricacies and, and there's a lot said in in a little bit of music um so it it's a it's a real special moment i think in the symphony this serious kind of tone that has different, um, you know, outlooks, you could say, on the future. And then things change in the third movement as if all the thought and, and, and introspection just completely goes away. We go to the dance and we have, it's like a folk song, folk dance, graceful and subtle. Um, it is so cute uh, if there's not a better word for the, the beginning of the third movement. And then it has these little firework passages that are kind of like Mendelssohn, um, Midsummer Night's Dream. It gets really fast and very light. And then it goes back to this little folk song. Um, what The character changes so much, right, in the third movement? Yeah, I think it's actually the most tricky ones, I think, uh, musical-wise, because um, it's it's simple in a way, like you said, with this folk, folk song, but it's a very artistic way. So it reminds me a little bit about those old menuet ideas. So people maybe in nice dresses, a little bit more formal. And the dancing is it's not like too free. It has a little bit, it's a little bit formal. And he plays with these formal things also in the harmony. And the harmony is sometimes getting suddenly very specific and more complicated so it's a little bit like very educated way of of folk music and that makes it tricky because it has to stay in a simple tone like you said with this folk music very elegant very easy but there's a lot of knowledge behind and that's the most tricky thing and then this middle part Mendelssohn thing you're right for me it's a little bit like expensive champagne yeah, da, 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 da. so expensive bubbles I told the orchestra it's not like this not like the Swedish champagne because that has no alcohol I have learned it's really <laughs> it's so funny they, they, when you do a concert there you get champagne or like uh, yeah the champagne afterwards but they are not allowed to sell alcohol so it's without it's it's also nice but it's not like the, the real one so and yeah. we're going for the real one so it's real bubbles yeah and 
talk about bubbles, um, effervescence and bright and just full of joy, the last moment, the finale. Um, it, it's, um, it starts in a very interesting way. It's got this really great tune in the strings with some winds, soft and softer and softer and softer and softer and then out of nowhere. Boom, it is rambunctious and it kind of just hits you over the head with excitement and energy and off to the races. Um, wow, what the finale. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's very smart how he connected the third to the fourth movement. That's why we, we, we end very soft and we start very soft. And for me, it's very funny because maybe something has happened on this dancing event. Yeah, and this is what we talked about the movement before. Because for me, it sounds a little bit like Tom, some rumors going on as, as if people have been to, I mean, to a party or whatever and saw something or knew something and thought, but you're not allowed to, to say it loud, but it's big rumor, something very serious and, and very heavy stuff. And then people try not to tell and, and it gets softer and softer and suddenly, why it's a big explosion and nobody, <laughs> everybody tells it and and then it's more like a, it's not a big drama. This this rumor, so it it sounds more like pure pure, pure fun and um, really a little bit like a joke, a little bit like this. So I, yeah. I, I enjoy that a lot. It's so so cool. Yeah, yeah. This last moment, it's so great that all the themes are just it they, like they feel like you're getting hugged by the music and. Yeah, and it's, party. it's also party music. It's really full of it's the, the joy of life and the passion, and you you do everything with all your all you have. So not just with a hat, but with a with a whole body, with every yeah, all yeah. You, you I was um, over it. I was reading some articles about this symphony, and uh, I think Toby, a uh, famous music scholar, said. The, the menacing trombones from the first movement have completely changed their attitude and they end the entire symphony with the most glorious like shout for joy at the very end. Um, I thought that was a nice connection. Like, you know, the, those who had a dark, a darkness over them have come to light at the end and boy, have they come to light. The, the very end of the movement is one of the most spectacular things ever, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, it's uh, so many bright colors suddenly. It's wow. It reminds me a bit when I was uh, uh, with our concert master. He showed me uh, the ocean. He took me around in his car. What was super nice. And then I, I was just looking at the Pacific and the and the light and then how the water and the cl no glimmer glimmering. No, how how do you say when? Yeah. 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 So, and it's a little, and, and that's the end of the symphony. It's like that when the light hits the blue water and, and everything is just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's an excellent way to describe the sound. For anybody who doesn't know this last movement and the way it ends, particularly, that's exactly what it is. And um, it is not down amazing music. If you don't know this symphony, or if you do know this symphony, if you're a fan of Brahms, or maybe even not a fan of Brahms, give this symphony a, a shot because it is really spectacular. It is about life. It's about the things that all of us are going through right now and optimism. I think we could all use a little bit of that. Um, I don't have, we don't have clips of our rehearsals of this piece, but we have a clip of you uh, with your orchestra from I believe September last year that I wanted to play and it, it is another fantastic ending. It's not the end of a symphony, but this is the end of the scherzo portion of Sibelius's Symphony Number no. Five, which is the internal second movement attached to the first movement. And this one also, I thought it was so similar in in ways. It's one big buildup that just takes off, lifts off the ground, and is released um, into just such an incredible energy and joy. So let's take a listen to the end of the scherzo of Sibelius number five. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you. 
well, incredible. Uh, so nice to see you work with your orchestra and what a fantastic moment of that symphony. I thought it was uh, similar in ways to the experience of parts of the Brahms. Um, maybe I'm way off on that, but the energy I thought was, uh, that kind of captures at the essence of the Brahms, at least the finale maybe. Yes, you're right. Yes, yes. Hey, it was my first try with Sibelius Five and the first concert with my new orchestra as chief conductor and my first and my debut in Concertgebouw. So it was a very specific moment and my parents were there in the concert. So it was very, a very specific moment. So, yeah. Wow. And talk about a great piece for that. At the end, the finale, just every time I get, I can't listen to that piece without tears in my eye. So beautiful, but we'll save Sibelius Five for, for next time then. <laughs> the, the, the concert uh, begins with Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, one of the, you know, pinnacle concertos for violin and a concerto, I think it's safe to say many, many people, musicians or non-musicians know this piece or, or can recognize a lot of it. There's so much in this music, lyric music and dance music and folk song and drama and everything you want in Tchaikovsky. In, in the grand sense of the three movements, how would you describe this to our audience? What are they gonna experience with this concerto if they're new to this piece? That's tricky to describe because for everybody it's different, but it's just, it's beautiful. It's full of power, full of, yeah, what you have said. And it's, uh, it's I, I have never spoken to anybody who does not like that piece. It's just, <laughs> it's so gorgeous and so cool and beautiful and we have a such a great soloist she is technical technically so so fantastic so for her it's not a problem to play it because it's very tricky and many players have problems with it to perform it in the right way but she has not for her it's easy so she can do whatever uh with it and to express it and and has and enjoys that so it's 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 really um a very virtuoso it's piece and, and also for the orchestra it's very nice this dialogue and then we're just chasing each other and running from one beautiful melody to the next and then from from some very relaxed moment in the in the in the slow movement where you really think about and you hold still and and you just your whole breathing gets a little bit slower and you really relax. And it's like with a good a glass of wine, you sit there and you think about the day and about how what's happened, to, or talking with friends sitting there. So it's it's a whole story within this concerto. Yeah, the, the narrative, the arc of the piece is complete in every way from the, the lyric melodic intensity of the first movement with its fire and the cadenza that is so fantastic. And then the, the song of the second movement and then another great finale. Um, a storm and a dance all combined in one sort of, it marches forward and it's got one of the best like folk tunes in the middle of it uh, interspersed. It is so exciting to hear it as a conductor we got a question, what are some of the challenges of conducting this concerto or concertos in, in general? Yeah, I think that you have to, to feel the soloist, that the soloist feels as free as possible and is not looking at you and following me, but trying to play her or his interpretation and that I'm in the middle, like between the soloist uh, then, then I, then I'm there, and the orchestra. So I try to to bring the solo, the orchestra as close as possible to the soloist, that the soloist feels free to do whatever, that we really hear his or her interpretation. That's what I think. What I, what is my job? In and that sometimes it's a bit tricky because for sure I have also an idea about the piece. It's tricky to 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 do it without any knowledge or like a white paper and, and to wait what a soloist is doing. And the older I get, I have to admit, the more complicated it gets because I have more and more also an idea how it should sound. And if somebody plays it in a completely different way, it's very challenging to accept that or to, yeah, or not accept, but also to understand. And that, but that, and that is the most tricky thing. If, if you have a soloist, you have to, like the same opinion about it, it's, it's very easy. 
But if it's an, another opinion, then it's not, oh, I don't like that. And, oh, let's, you have to do it like what I No, You have to understand. And only if you really understand what a soloist wants, then you, it will be, it comes to life. Otherwise, it's just you play to, together or at the same time, but it's not an interpretation together. And you have to make sure that you're on the same, on the same page. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I imagine following that up that, a lot of it is the preparation that both bring to the table because there's not a lot of time spent together before you have to go do it. So having all of that preparation and musical forethought is what then makes uh, the magic happen. Although sometimes there are differing uh, views, a great artist working with a great artist is, is probably gonna make some great music. And that's definitely what we've been experiencing. Uh, Bonsori is uh, a soft-spoken, violinist until she starts to play uh, what would you say about her playing yeah she's very energetic yeah. and and uh and she plays very with a very beautiful tone and very perfect technique but suddenly she has an idea or when it gets a little bit more excited then she also gets excited and then she she wants something from us and then she gets really like a power woman and i like that a lot and then she looks with that eyes to me and anya go for it and <laughs> And then I, I said, okay, let's do it. So our first run through through the, through the first movement got very fast because we both were so excited and we pushed each other and the orchestra too, because the orchestra also wants to show up that they can play like the same, especially all the violins, you know, when you have such a great soloist, everybody wants to show I'm as, <laughs> as, as the soloist minimum. So everybody play and it was so nice to see. It's, it's like, a, yeah. Lots of, yeah, it was so, so exciting. Yeah, yeah even though this, um, this is a concerto uh, commonly played, it never is boring. There's never a dull moment, especially when the music making is so alive. And we actually have a great clip. Uh, so Rosalind asked about some examples. We have a clip from last night's rehearsal, which was the first rehearsal with our soloist. Let's take a listen to the Tchaikovsky. Hi, this is Boom Sorry. I'm here to play with uh, Pacific Symphony Orchestra in Orange County. And this is my debut with the orchestra. I'm very excited. And I'm playing Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto with uh, the conductor, Anya Bilmeyer. This piece is actually the first piece I fell in love when I first heard of this. I think it was like when I was eight or nine. Tchaikovsky himself was such a dramatic person and he had a dramatic life. And that really, um, this piece shows his life very much because it was written when he was very depressed and he was actually wanted to recover from his uh, depression. And it was written in Swiss, uh, in, in the very beautiful place in, in Clarence in Swiss, which is the shore of the Geneva Lake. And that's why it gives such a uh, imaginative scenery in this piece. And you can really um, see the scenery, like the beautiful um, nature in the piece, the very uh, popular theme of the first movement when the violin solo is coming. Uh, alone after the big orchestra duty, we are coming alone, and and then we have this very beautiful sorrow but sweet tema uh, with the orchestra after our solo parts. The second movement has such a sad romance in the in in the part, and um, but it's actually repeating some. Uh, few times but it gives such a different feeling from the beginning I mean first time second time third time uh, because it follows the storylines I believe and it when you follow the storyline of your your imagination then you will feel the 
the different feelings as well with the same uh, tema in the second movement. Wow, uh, not bad for a first time through right there. It was so exciting to be there and um, just to watch it back again. Uh, it's really going to be quite special, I think. Um, Anya, any thoughts about the concerto before? Um, I have just a few more questions and then we'll be done. But anything else for our listeners regarding the concerto? Uh, for me, it's just also, I mean, uh, what Bomsori said, he had this depression and also Brahms had this depression, like having over 20 years writing this first symphony and Tchaikovsky also this um, unhappy marriage. And when he found out he is not like going to do that. And then they both went to a nice lake and into a nice scenery, into a nice nature and they recovered somehow. And I, uh, last week I was at this lake in, in Genève. I, I contacted Lausanne Orchestra and I was there and I, I, I saw those beauty. And I, I really understand why Tchaikovsky could recover with that. And um, I think it's, it's so perfect like the here, the scenery, the nature, the elements, what, what gives us, or for me at least, I, I get lots of energy and lots of inspiration from the nature and the beauty. And um, yeah, and so we have this program is so perfect. I, I mean, I am, I'm realizing that now. Okay, when I planned the concert, yeah, we had also this Nadia Boulanger piece, what we're now not gonna perform because it, it would have been too big. But I thought, yeah, the music, it fits well together. It will be good and, and nice and everything. But now I realize that it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and here is specific and in and, and this specific scenery and also how the orchestra responds and the energy of, of, of our players and the whole and everything. It's just perfect. It is. It's, it's really, uh, it's really like a present for me. And I'm so much looking forward. And I hope that we have lots of, uh, lots of your fans coming. Absolutely to see your orchestra and yeah me me too and um i i mean i feel like i have one of the best jobs in the world too because i get to be there in the moments as they're happening and uh mm. i love i love what i've heard so far um we're almost out of time but we've gotten a few questions and um i want to ask one from fiona which is a great question what maestro what got you into conducting why conducting um did, was there something that happened early on as a as a musician studying or when did you know you wanted to become a conductor? Yeah, that was actually it happened in school because I went to um, yeah to gymnasium and there was a lot of music and I wanted to play in the orchestra and then we had no money for any instrument so I was playing recorder at home for for a long time and then I came to this gymnasium I wanted to be part of the orchestra and then they gave me a violin and, and I got lessons and then I was allowed to play after a very short time Dvorak's this New World Symphony. Second violin last stand and I played maybe only half of the notes or not even. I was very very bad but this and then I saw this our teacher conducting that and he was such a passionate person and I was a part of that and it, it I fall in love with the whole system with everything and I, and this way of communication and then I practiced a lot and then I learned piano and got help. And this teacher, he saw that I'm very much about, so excited about conducting and just watching him. And he sent me to a choir conducting course. Um, that was eight weekends. I was maybe 17 then. And when I came back from this course, um, I was allowed to conduct a small mini opera with 95th class students. And I had like mini orchestras and soloists and choir, it was like opera. And when I stood then in front of them, I felt this energy and I've just knew that is my place in life. I just knew it. It sounds a little bit like, yeah, but it was like that. I was so happy to have this huge instrument to bring all the knowledge together from all players and to, because I was always good and trying to make people building a team and getting things. But then it was the combination with music and, and, and the people and, these not, and all those things. And I found out that that's what I want to do. And from that point on, I knew that's, that's, that's what I want to go for. And that's what I need to do. That's why I'm born. I really knew that. And then my parents said, yeah, oh God, studying music is bad enough. How do you want to make money? 
So please become a music teacher first. So I had to study history and um, becoming music teacher. And when I was 25, then I got an extra permission from my university to that I could apply for the conducting um, study. And then I, I got an, yeah, I was accepted. Only female, the only female student <laughs> was still very like only male persons. It's still in Germany, very uh, tricky. But yeah, and then I always follow the path, and um, and I'm I know it's it's that's what I have to do and what makes me happy, and yeah, that's how it yeah. works. Yeah, and it, it has been so great to to look at your career and what it's doing for female conductors. Um, it's great to see that the tide is changing, and um, I know many of my friends who are still in school are were so excited to tune into this today because they're on that pathway as, as a female conductor. And what you provide is so fantastic and amazing. And it goes beyond uh, whatever that is. It's about making music and it's about having something to say and giving back. And it's clear to me that you are just amazing. And we are so lucky to have you this uh, <laughs> I'm I'm lucky and happy to be here and, and enjoying to making music with you. It's always it's a it's we are a team and I'm nothing without the instrument and with without the play. Everybody like is an artist in this orchestra. Every player and has so much personality and his own life and and everybody is bringing everything into it. So that's why we are, we are so rich and why uh, that's why we have so much energy and why we can give so much and offer to our audience because that's why are we here and why are we doing that and yeah and and with you you will help us to to perform better to to listen to it so we are a huge team also behind the scenes and you can feel that and only if everybody is into the is wanting to give his her best then it comes together and that's why we're here that's our that's our task. And I'm here just to, to say yes and to, to go for it and bring everybody together and to say, yeah, you're great. Please join. And I love to do that. Absolutely. This concert is for you, our audiences, our community. It's our thank you. And uh, I, hope you can, I hope you can be there. And if you can't be at one of our concerts, uh, again, Friday is the live stream. So concerts are uh, Thursday, January 27th. Friday, January 28th, and Saturday, January 29th, all at 8 p.m. And of course, Friday, we will be live streaming on YouTube. Uh, as well, our uh, pre-concert talks will resume with Alan Chapman. He's back. And those begin at 7 o'clock in the concert hall. Doors to the concert hall, I believe, open at 645. And all information about protocols, concert hall etiquette, everything can be found on our website, pacificsymphony.org. It has been such a pleasure to talk with our guest conductor this week, Anya Billmeyer, as she walked us through the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto and the Brahms Symphony Number no. 2 that you will be hearing in uh, just a day. So I hope to see you all there or catch you online. Anya, again, thank you so much for your time. Everybody, thank you. thank you for joining us for this mixer. It's been too long. I'm so happy that we're back to doing these. I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Take care. Anya, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. See thanks, you. everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good night.